we're going to tackle it. We're, I like it so much that we're going to tackle it in two different classes. We're going to do this Mishnah for, for this week. Oh, next week might be Shavuot. Uh, I got, hold on, let me just tell you real quick. If we don't have class next week. It's not. It's, it's not Shavuot. Memorial, it's Memorial Day. Yeah. Oh, it's Memorial Day. Right, well, that's one more week. Hi, all right, all right. That's fine with me if it's fine with you guys. Um, so, uh, so, okay, so, so just to catch us up, because we had a little bit of a, um, we did a special event last week. So now we're focusing again on Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and his students. Don't forget that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is the preeminent, we, we, we kind of call him the rabbi of Judaism because he took, he literally saved Judaism after the Jews, um, after the second temple was destroyed and the Jews were um, exiled for the next 2000 years from the land, meaning from the time of the biblical era, when they, when they enter into the land of Israel, and then they're in the land of Israel until the, the, um, until the um, destruction of the first temple, many are exiled and some do come back for the second temple. But by the time 70, um, after the common era, um, 2000 years ago, by the time they're expelled from the, from, from, um, the land of Israel, that second time around, um, Judaism is extremely, extremely precarious and fragile because so much of what made Judaism, Judaism was dependent on the existence of a temple in Jerusalem. So once you took Judaism from its indigenous soil, from its like natural roots. It was almost like you were pulling out a tomato and you were putting it, you know, in, in a bowl. Like how was Judaism going to survive separate from the temple, separate from the temple service, separate from the land of Israel? And this was 2000 years ago and Rabbi, Yehoshu, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai really saved Judaism and he saved it through, through five preeminent students. And in this Mishnah, Rabbi Yochanan tells his five students something very cryptic, which is go out, well, well we should read it in the Hebrew. Um, if I can find my book, here we go. Okay, one second. It's always good to read it in Hebrew. I'm gonna read the first part in Hebrew because we're only gonna tackle the first part. Okay. Um, okay, so by Amar Lahem, he said to them, so go out, uru'u, Ezehi derech tova. Go out and see what is the good way. What is the, like, if what, find the way. Find for yourself the one way that people should live by. What, in what way should a person live? Now, this is really important because they, they look so deceptively simple. It looks, it looks almost like embarrassingly simple. Um, but if you understand the time period that this takes place, you can almost imagine Rabbi Yochanan saying to his five students, I know through incredible, incredible, incredible greatness, Rabbi Yochanan had probably what we'd call like Ruach HaKodesh or the ability to see at least partially into the future. I know Jewish people that you're going to have def terribly difficult years ahead. Because when we think about the 2000 years after the destruction of the second temple, when the Jews were exiled from their indigenous soil, they had tremendous, tremendous devastation from the pogroms and inquisitions and the crusades and the terrible poverty and the being rejected and thrown out and cast away from virtually every land culminating in the Holocaust itself. Literally the Holocaust itself it's as if Rabbi Yochanan is saying to his students, to his, to his preeminent students, and when I say students, I don't just mean, you know, the ones who got an A in his class, I mean the ones who are literally going to pass on the Torah received from Sinai onto the next generation that was going to be the first true generation of exile. So the stakes were very high, and it's almost like Rabbi Yochanan is saying it's going to be very, very difficult what is the one thing that you have in the world of ethics, in the world of morality, what's the one thing that matters more than anything else? 
So these, these, they're almost childlike seemingly, the things that he's saying, but they're not. They're actually, each one is very, very deep. And today we're only gonna tackle the first one. So Rabbi Yochanan said to them, so uru adam. What's the good path that a person should cleave to? Rabbi Eliezer Omer, ayin tova. Rabbi Eliezer says, a good eye. Okay, and they go on to say what 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 other qualities um, are 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 the one quality. By the way, um, there I think it's the the Bart Nura. I actually wrote it down. Where did I write it? I don't know where I wrote it. The Bart Nura. I think it's the Bart Nura or the Abarbanel. I can't remember who um, talks about this idea of one thing, and I think this is relevant for us. Uh, that at the end of your life, like what's the one character trait that you're going to really acquire? You know, do you, do you, are you, do you smile at everyone you meet? Are you careful not to speak negatively of people? Do you come through for the underdog? Are you a great listener? Are you careful with the mitzvah of lighting candles? Even if you don't eat fully kosher, are you very careful not to eat a specific kind of food? Or in the world of ethics, are you, um, are you, are you absolutely painstakingly honest with all things money related? Whatever it is, this idea that, that our life we should um, own, we should really embrace and own something specific, a mitzvah, a way of being, like one, one thing. And this actually really is a Jewish idea. It's, it's in the Talmud, it's in the sages, this idea of making one mitzvah, or maybe you love the, you know, the mitzvah of tzedakah, or maybe you're somebody who's always, you know, giving to people in need, or whatever it is. It's, it's the idea of, that we are by nature complex people. We do good, we do not so good. We do mitzvahs, we do not mitzvahs. We are complex, but if you can imagine yourself going at the end of your days to the Kisei HaKavod, to God's throne after your life, like in your hands almost, if you were like with, with, with a mitzvah that you said, Hashem, God, this is my mitzvah. I took it very seriously. I sacrificed for it. It wasn't just that it was easy and I love to do it. I actually sacrificed for it. So we should all think about this concept uh, in, in Perki Avos of, of go out and see what is derech tova. What's the one good way? So it's almost as if Rabbi Yochanan, he's saying to his students, go out and see what is the one quality that the Jewish people should cleave to as they embark on 2000 years of treacherous exile. But he's also saying to us, because Perke Avos is, is infinite, um, see for yourself, what's the one good way that you want to acquire? And, and, and it really should be, you know, a lot of positive psychology and, you know, a lot of interesting things talks about, you know, in that sort of general sphere, talk about the, you know, the Venn diagram. We've talked about this many times, the kissing point of three, of three areas. So a Venn diagram, obviously, um, an area of it is separate, but it all meets in one given place. And I think it's Tal Ben Shachar, uh, Professor Tal Ben Shachar, who is a, a great professor. He was a professor and he taught the most popular course in Harvard's history on happiness. And then he subsequently moved back to Israel. But he says that, you know, there's a Venn diagram and, and our happiness is really dependent on a, the kissing point between what we're good at, what we're naturally good at, where we, what we find meaningful. In other words, you might be very good at something that isn't very meaningful for you or doesn't give you a ton of pleasure or meaning. Um, so what you're naturally good at that you get a lot of meaning and pleasure from that gives, gives something back to the world. And the kissing point between those three things, good at, meaning and pleasure, give back to the world. The place where that meets, that's your mitzvah. And, and that's really, it does, Rabbi Yochanan isn't saying, 
at the expense of everything else. He's not saying you should have a good eye, but you don't need to be a good friend. You don't need a good heart, but he's saying, own it. What's the one thing that you want to own? And he's telling us that too. And if we're trying to figure out what that thing is for us, we should think of that kissing point on the Venn diagram of, of meaning and pleasure, meeting what we're naturally good at, meeting how we give back to the world. The, um, the, he, he's really also taking his five students out of the ivory tower, out of what we say in Hebrew, we say the base medrash, which is like this insular world of Torah, where you eat Torah, you drink Torah, you sleep Torah, you breathe Torah, you are totally insular. And he's saying to his students that if you stay totally insular when the Jewish world is in such distress, which is really every generation in its own way, the Jewish world is in distress. For example, in America right now, the Jewish world is in distress. The, the, the universities are, are extreme, they're bastions of anti-Israel sentiment. Just ask Hannah Anderson and she'll tell you all about it. So the Jewish world is always in distress. We say that in the Haggadah, we say in every generation, someone rises up to destroy us. It sounds very maudlin, but really what it's saying is the Jewish world is always going to be on the precipice of something very distressing. It's happening in Israel. It's happening in America. Why? Because as Jews, our actions matter. And we should always see what we do, what we bring to the world as being the tipping point. That's what the Maimonides says, that our actions might be the tipping point. So we don't have a perfect world. And the Jewish world is always in some form of distress because God wants us to partner with him in rectifying and perfecting the world. So you've got to figure out what's my derech tova? What's my good path? Where am I, what am I naturally inclined toward that gives me meaning and pleasure that I can do to give back to the world? So Rabbi Yochanan is saying, get out of your ivory tower. It's almost like, I think it was, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who likened it to a bottle, if, if a person has what to give and they keep it to themselves, they're like a bottle of perfume with the top turned on tight. So can, no one can smell it. So they might have this wonderful smell, so to speak. They might have something to offer to the world, but if the cap's on tight, screwed on tight, then the world won't benefit from it. So he's saying, to his student out of your ivory tower, the Jewish world and the world itself needs what you bring to the world. So find out what it is and, 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 and see what does the world need. They go on to, to say what they think the world needs. And that's what, what we're going to look at. We're only going to look at a good eye today. Or as we say in Hebrew, an ayin tova, Right? Most of you have heard that before, um, but we don't always know what it means. I think, um, I think on the most simple level, which I didn't include here, but Maimonides, Nachmanides, and many, many other thinkers um, clarify that there is, there is a quality of good eye, which means happy, for what other people have. The ability to be happy when someone gets something wonderful, achieves something wonderful, and to add to that, even when it's something you want and currently don't have. That really is the most simple definition of ayin tova that many of the sages bring up, is to be, is to be happy with other, what to, to rejoice in, not just to share people's pain, but to share people's joy, especially when they have something that you don't and you want. It's pretty easy to celebrate someone's joy when it has nothing to do with you. But if it has something to do with you and you don't have it, you know, you just lost all your money and, you know, you're suffering terribly financially and your friend just makes it huge in this new company that, you know, and, and they're just rocking it and you're, you're, you're struggling terribly financially. And I and Tova is, I take pleasure in your joy. Now we're going to understand that it, that's not just like a, 
oh, it's not just a nice way of being, it's actually rooted in something far deeper. And we are gonna talk about how a person can truly, truly get pleasure from other people's joy, even when they want the thing that that person has. It's rooted in something very, very powerful, and we're gonna get to it. So Rabbi Eliezer said, a good eye. According to Rabbi Eliezer, a Talmudic sage, one of the most important traits that a person can develop is a good eye, which means, and that's our, that's our Mishnah, which means the ability to interpret our world positively. Okay, so now we are moving into another definition of ayin tova. Uh, right, Hannah, that's right, Tal ben Shachar. And he, he's the one who talks about the meeting point of those three things that make, that's how, how, what is happiness? Happiness is when somebody engages in something that they're good at, that gives them meaning and pleasure, that gives back to the world. So it's up to all of us to think of our derech tova, of our, of our good path. But so, so, so we have one definition that our sages give us, and now Rabbi Eliezer is offering us another definition, the ability to interpret our world positively. Not so easy when the world is, has a spinning horrible news, on a 24 hour news cycle, spinning it, you know, in a way that riles us no matter where we stand politically, it's designed to polarize and demonize the other side and make you feel righteous in your positions and demonize the other side and almost satirize and subjectify, excuse me, objectify the other side that with the other side that you don't agree with. That is the essence of the world of media. There used to be at least a pretense of not being biased. Now there's no such, there's not even a pretense of not being biased. And it's all designed for you to live in a state of agitation around the other. And so we're, we were almost in terms of like negativity and negative energy, we're a little bit like the proverbial frog in the pot of water, the water starts cold. David, hold your thought. And then when we're done, we'll, we'll um, I always, I'm gonna stop with 15 minutes at the end. So I'm gonna talk for like 17 more minutes. And then with our last 15 minutes, we're gonna take comments. Okay. So, so we're like the frog in the water and we don't always know that the water is heating up and we're not always aware that something's really wrong because it's our water, it's what we're used to. We don't live, we live in a world that's exuding a lot of negative energy. And yet, Rabbi Eliezer says, the one, the derech tova yeshara, the one straight and good way of being in this world with all of its challenges is you gotta have a good eye. A, you've got to take pleasure and other people's joy, especially when it's something that you don't have that you want. And we're going to talk about how to get there. And B, you've got to train your brain. And that's really the MS. It's really the truth. It's really retraining the brain to interpret our world positively. How do we do this? Sarah Riegler goes on. The way God made our world, however, makes positive interpretation quite the challenge. Okay, we're not the first generation. An ayin toba means to interpret the world positively, but God makes the world so that in positive interpretation is not easy. There's evil, there's darkness all around us. There are problems at all levels from the political to the personal. Neither nations nor individuals find it easy to live in harmony, that's for sure. Our imperfect worlds and relationships give us much to complain about. And there's a lot of negativity to focus on. I do wanna say that the brain is your perfect servant. It does your bidding. If you wake up in the morning and you say, the world is such a messed up place, then the brain, like a perfect servant, will seek confirmation for that belief in everything it sees. And it will confirm you, strengthening your pathway in your brain that says the world is a horrible place. So the brain follows your beliefs. If you have a belief that the world is, is, is not a safe place, that it's not a good place, then your subconscious, it, your, your brain seeks to confirm it 
in what you read and how you interpret what you read and what you see and how you communicate. And we're living in that space. It's always easier to see what's glaringly wrong than to see what is subtly right. That's really important. The wrong will always be glaring and the right will always be subtle. And yet, she continues, the right is only subtle when we relegate it to a small corner of our universe. This is so powerful. Sarah Regler, she's such a good writer. We do have the option, should we desire, to promote the subtle, the subtle good to a front and central location where it can become the focus of our intention. Attention. A customer representative. Uh, uh, Don, I think you're, yeah. Um, we do have the option, should we desire to promote it to a front and central location where it can become the focus of our attention. Engaging in this act is what constitutes the development of our good eye. This is so incredibly important. Okay, so let's just take this apart for a minute. El Rav Eliezer says, in life, if you're gonna do one thing, it's, it's have a good eye. What, what does he say it means? The ability to interpret our world positively. But the very God that wants us to live with a good eye in absolute consciousness, so to speak, creates a world filled with negativity where you're always choosing whether to interpret it positively or negatively. Now the negative is all over the place. Even within two people, it is so hard to live in a state of positivity. There is so much potential darkness to focus on. And the brain will often focus on what's wrong. I'd like to, instead of me telling you why I think that is, why do we remember bad stuff more? Why do we focus on what's wrong more? Just keep that question in your eye. Why does the bias toward negativity like way more than the bias toward positivity? So keep that in your mind as a question because I'd like some, I'd like people to weigh in. So so it's always going to be that the what's wrong is always, I mean, just, just go to the, read the news. What's negative is always glaring. And what's positive, you know, is on the bottom of the page, right? If you're so, so, but that's only true. If we haven't trained our brain to promote the subtle to a front and central location where it becomes the focus of our attention. This is so important because what I what I really truly believe and I've come to understand is is the the, the fulfilling the self-fulfilling prophecy of negative beliefs if you believe that you can't stand this person she's so annoying then everything you see in her is going to confirm that she is annoying and that's what you'll see um, so the your brain is going to seek to confirm and and and, and kind of like make right your original belief. So it's so critical in our lives that we question the beliefs we're walking around with. One way to, um, one way to really start waking up and being conscious of what you're walking around with is next time, it'll probably happen in, within the next few hours, next time you're feeling upset about something, you're anxious, you're sad, you're depressed, you're frustrated, you're annoyed, you're irritated. Next time you sense that in your body, uh, you, you just feel it and it's sort of this amorphous yuck, you don't know exactly what it is, stop and ask yourself the $24,000 question, which is, what am I believing right now that's making me feel this way? Ask yourself that. It's the most, one of the most important questions you can ever learn. What am I believing right now that's making me feel this way? Because it's very hard to tackle amorphous feelings of frustration or whatever, or negativity. But if you can identify the belief that you're believing about a person, about yourself, about whatever, then you can start to question it. And you can start to understand what it means when you walk around believing it. That when you walk around believing it, as Rabbi Eliezer says, you're inviting it because your brain is seeking to confirm it. So just next time, like, like picture a piece of gum that you're pulling like this, like slow the stimulus down, right? Slow it down and ask yourself, okay, 
uh, I see that I'm upset. What am I believing right now that's making me feel this way? And get to the get to the real the the real thought. And that's when and that's when we can seek to shift it. And that's called the development of an eye in Tova, the development of a good eye. It doesn't mean some people are born, you know, sunny side up and some people are born sunny side down. And, you know, that what can you do about it? It means that Rabbi Elias are saying in this world of darkness, of confusion, of discord, of conflict, the good is always going to be more subtle. Your job is to bring the subtle into your front, the front of your brain, and then manifest it as your brain seeks to confirm what it believes in our world. So when you start to see the world is essentially good, you'll see it. You'll see it in nature. You'll see it in little acts of kindness. You'll see it all over the place if you look for it. But if you, but if you relegate it to the small corner of your mind, then your brain will seek to confirm your negative beliefs. That's really what Rabbi Eliezer is saying. Um, Julie, go down a little bit. I want to I wanna take, all right, I'm going to talk for 10 more minutes and then, um, so I'm not going to do everything here. Um, right, I do want to keep in mind that there, there was a beautiful book. I can't remember who wrote it, but it was a Lubavitch, it was a Chabad um, writer, and I can't remember who it was. He wrote a book called The Positivity Bias um, because the Rebbe adamantly refused to see negativity in anything in the world. And he would always extract, it was, he, he, he truly lived in a, in a state that the world is a good place. And so, but we, in general, if we remember our childhood, we'll remember what was hard. Why does the negative weigh so much more than the positive? Um, th there's a lot of Torah here, and I'm and I'm thinking about what to um, what to focus on. I think well, I think I'm going to skip the whole creation story, even though it's incredibly interesting. And I am going to tell you that that it it is unbelievable. <laughs> It's unbelievable how important um, a good eye is. So we're, 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 so far we have two definitions. One, one is truly taking joy in other people's joy, especially when they're ha they have something that you want. Julie, go, go down a little bit, please, um, to personal insecurity. And the other one is retraining your brain to relegate the subtle to the central in your brain so that it then seeks to confirm what you believe in real time. So Julie, just go down if you will to personal insecurity. If you can go up, up to the bottom of the page. Do you see where I am? Bottom of the page, Julie? Julie? I don't know if she sees me. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, so yeah, stop there. So um, the, the, um, What's really remarkable is that even our history itself, Jewish history itself, there was one moment in time that was based on a negative eye, an eye in Ra, a negative eye, and all of Jewish history was a response to that negative eye. What happened? God in the desert, God, as God gives the Torah to the Jewish people and subsequently promises the land of Israel and promises that the Jewish people will conquer the land of Israel. And then for very interesting reasons that actually are very relevant to our discussion, and I'm gonna say them because they're very relevant. There are, there are opinions that when the spies, most of you know the story, that when the, or some of you might not, when the spies, that, that while they were in the desert, they asked Moses if they had permission to send spies into the land of Israel on a reconnaissance mission in order to test it out and come back and tell the Jewish people about the land. Now, Moses didn't want them to do that because God promised them the land and they just really needed to connect to their faith in God and it was promised to them. But he begrudgingly allows them to do it. Now, what's very interesting, our commentators tell us is they were 
These spies were no gaya but davar. That means they were biased. Why were they biased? They were very powerful in the desert. They had big um, positions of princehood in the desert. Let's say they were the mayors and the governors, so to speak, in the desert. And so they had a lot to lose. And they were afraid that when they entered the land of Israel, they were going to lose their positions. The, the reason I'm telling you this very obscure opinion that some commentators have is that you also have to be so aware of your biases. Like when you are inclined to see somebody or something negatively. What that means is that there's a part of you, if you're in a difficult relationship, if you're in a, if you're specifically in the realm of relationships, that wants to see the person make the mistakes. Because as long as that person is in the wrong, you're in the right, you're the victim. You, you have, you have uh, the right, so to speak, to be blameless or whatever it is. So we're biased. If you are a Democrat, you wanna see the Republicans this way. If you're a Republican, you wanna see the Democrats this way. We're walking into any given thing that we read or see or any dynamic with a bias toward how we're going to see it. And that was what the spies did. And because the spies reported back that the land of Israel was uninhabitable, it was inconquerable and wreaked havoc on the faith and, um, and confidence of the Jewish people, then God subsequently says to them, because you wept without cause, because you caused mass weeping among the people, we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it, even though I had promised you the land so many times, because you created this, this is the day that I will establish as a time of weeping throughout the generations. This was Tisha B'Av. It was the first Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the day of mourning. It was the day that the spies came back and wreaked havoc on the faith and trust of the Jewish people. Why? Because they wanted to see it negatively. It's really, it's really an invitation for you to ask yourself, what am I predisposed to see negatively? What am I predisposed to find fault with? What, why, what motivates me to find fault with this? Is it because it vindicates me? It makes me feel righteous or right? So this, so this was Tisha B'Av, the, the day that the first temple was destroyed, the day that the second temple was destroyed, the, 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 worst, the worst day of the Spanish Inquisition, so many, so many, like over a thousand years later, this, this is the day of tragedy for the Jewish people. Ultimately, our, our Torah tells us, and our, our sources in the, in the, the Talmud tells us, tell us that Tisha B'Av will become a holiday. It will become a day of great rejoicing. A day of weeping will become a day of rejoicing. And if we're gonna carry that metaphor for into our personal lives, I think the message for us is, we have the ability to turn a negative bias into a positive bias. We have, just like God can change Tisha B'Av from a day of mourning to a day of celebration one day in the Messianic era, we too have the ability to shift a negative bias to a positive bias. It's all about what, where, where in position of our brain, what's subtle, what's central? What am I making central? What am I making subtle? It, it's a world where the negative is very obvious, every generation. And yet the development of a good eye, and also I think it's also a true point. It's not just having a good eye, like you're born with it. It's actively seeking to see that the world is essentially good. Um, Julie, will you go down again? Keep going. Yeah, we're going to skip that because we don't really, um, so we don't really have time to do that. Okay, so we are actually at the 15 minute mark and I wanna open it up to the group. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else 
that is absolutely essential. Oh yes, there is one thing that I wanna say and then I wanna open it up to the group. The original definition, the original definition we defined as being happy for somebody when they have something, especially when they have something that you want and don't have. Health, money, a happy marriage, X, Y, or Z, right? So how can it be? What does it mean to truly have a good eye if we're going to use that definition? Now, the best way to understand it is to understand that the Ten Commandments existed on two tablets. And commentators tell us that each, that the first one's related to the last one. The first five were on one tablet. The second five were on the second tablet. Um, happy with their lot. That's true. That is absolutely true. But the two tablets. So the first is related to the last. The second is related to the ninth. The third is related to the eighth. The fourth is related to the seventh and so on and so forth. The last of the 10 commandments is the strangest commandment in the world. It's literally a commandment to not be jealous. It's not, to not covet, but it's an emotion. You know, there's kill and steal and keep the Shabbat and honor your parents. These are, um, these are actions. And then, and then there's actually a commandment not to feel a certain way. So how do we get there? Our sages tell us we get there through the through its relationship, through the channel of the relationship to the first commandment. Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Asher Zisi me Eretz Mitzrayim Lahios Lahem Lalokim. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. What does that mean? It means everything that you have. Everything that you don't have is from me. It's exactly what you need to fulfill your, your tikkun, your journey, your soul's journey in this world. Some people have incredible struggles, indescribable struggles. You couldn't even, you can't even, your brain can't even contemplate them. They're so bad, so hard. And some people don't. But everybody has a tikkun. Their soul needs to go some, through something and what they have and what they don't have and where they are in history, who their parents are, where they were born, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, where their challenges are. What the, it is exactly what they need. Not a thing more, not a thing less. Now you try to obtain more. You try to do better, you try to achieve, but you understand that whatever you have at any given moment is because that is exactly what you need. That's, I am the Lord, your God, not the Lord, your God, who's not involved in your lives, but God forbid, but the Lord, your God, who took you out of Egypt, the Lord of God, who's actively involved in human history and in your history. So our sages say, how can God command you not to have the feeling of jealousy? Well, if you want to know, then go to its source, which is the first commandment, because everything that is your life is from me for you to grow. Not a thing more, not a thing less. Go work, achieve, work hard, go to the doctors, do whatever you can to be healthy, to be successful, but know that at every given moment, Whatever you have and whatever you don't have is exactly what you need. And that is the basis of not being jealous. Emuna, trust and faith that everything you have is from an all loving, all knowing, one creator, one source of all things is the foundation of jealousy. And conversely, I'll end this here and then we'll open it up. The Torah tells us something really amazing, that when you covet, when you're envious of what somebody else has, the sages tell us, I, I actually wrote this down, but I lost where I wrote it, so whatever. Um, the sages tell us that two thing, you lose two things. A, you don't get what that person has because you can never get what another person has. It's for them. But then it tells us something also really amazing. You lose what you have. 
Meaning when you are looking at somebody else's world, you're not focused in your own. You stepped out of yourself to look at what somebody else has, which means you're not focused. You've relegated to the back of your mind all the incredible good that you do have. So you don't get what that you don't get theirs, but you don't even get yours because you're focused on theirs. So these this these are the two the definitions I want to leave you with. How are you truly joyful, especially when it's something that you want? Because of Amuna, because of the faith and trust that God, that everything we have and don't have comes from the one source that is all loving, and that is God. And the other, the other area is constantly seeking to make central what we relegate naturally to the subtle, to, to, the, to the back parts of our brain, which is the world is good. How can you work on this? Anytime you're agitated, anytime you're out of sorts, anytime you're feeling just low and ick and blah and you don't know why, stop and ask yourself, what am I believing right now that's making me feel that way, this way? Identify the thought and write it down. And there are amazing ways to, to, to challenge those thoughts, but we don't have time. But first know what it is that you're telling yourself. Okay, we're going to open it up now with our last 10 minutes and hear from the group. So David, you had a, a statement of something. And also I did ask the question, why does the negative weigh so much more than the positive? But you guys can bring up anything that you want. Yeah, we were talking about our goals in life. So um, we should attempt to collect the shards of the broken vessel. Hey, did you read the article? Well, I've read that. I don't know which article oh. you refer to. Oh, I, I, I thought, okay, so, so what does that mean, David? So uh, when the earth was created, the, the vessels were broken, everything was scattered to the far ends of the, of the earth. And uh, we'd like to get that back to where uh, we were in perfection when the the earth was created and it's a long way back, but we should strive to get there. David, I just wrote an article for H.com today and it's, it's exactly about that. So please read it because it's exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's uh, it literally exactly what you're talking about. So please go read it if you will. Just go to H.com. Yes. Yeah. Also, Julie sent us the link in her. Oh, yeah. Um, but I don't know if Dave is on that list. Oh, okay. Hi, Donna. I added David. He should be getting it. I don't know if he did or not. I am now on the list. Thank you. Okay. okay so Julie will send it to you. Okay. Hi, Donna. Hi, Ellie. Hi, everybody. Um, I. I've been listening and listening and some I've heard, I've learned some of it before and it's still, it's so helpful to hear it again and again. And, you know, really it helps to, you get, take it in. And I just wanted to say that I've been contemplating um, reaching out in this one part of my life and I've been struggling, not quite ready to do it, not quite ready to do it. And then you spoke, you know, in your teachings of, of finding your, who you are and, putting yourself out there. And it was just so interesting timing. It was just, just what I needed to hear. I'm not so sure I'm still <laughs> ready to do it still. Well, Donna, did, are you referring to, this is something that gives me meaning and pleasure that I'm naturally good at, that is a way of giving back to the world? Is that what you were yes, touching that on? Part of, yes, that piece. Yeah. And that does piece. this thing that shall remain nameless, does mm -hmm. it cover all of those areas i think it covers a lot of it i think it does it brings up a little bit of angst too it brings there's like two a little different sides to this that i'm contemplating kind of thinking about um but i'm gonna think about it some more now <laughs> where i kind of set it aside and said you know i do have a lot going on right now with things but no buts just moving through and so but it was just like the timing you know, it was just Maybe what I needed to hear at this time. Also, really the fact beautiful. that you have angst about it is part 
of the whole, it's part of the experience. Oh, I know. You're, because you're meant to have angst with it. Okay. okay. You're, you know, in other words, it's not given to you on a golden platter. You're meant to experience angst about it so that you can acquire it so that it's really yours, that you really worked hard to get there. So I don't know what that is, but, <laughs> but the angst is part of the, it's part of it. Very nice. Thank you. I'm going to consider that. It's helpful. You're the best. Thank you. <laughs> you are too. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. Oh. Well, I, I think you asked a very important question, and it's one I've been kind of struggling with over the past few weeks, in particular in light of the world's news. Um, from a Jewish perspective, why is the negative so much more visible than the positive? Who wants to weigh in? Why is the negative glaring and the good is almost intentionally subtle? Ellie, can I say something? I think that with myself, like, uh, you know, I try to be a happy person. You know, I get up, I do the day, modani. But it seems like when somebody, you know somebody that all of a sudden you think there's something wrong with them or their life is bad, it's great because then my life doesn't look as bad. I, I mean, I don't feel that way, but I think that it's sometimes much, much easier to go along with their negativity as opposed to see the good side. Does that make sense? It's easier to like, almost like it's contagious, almost like just- to... Yeah, yeah. Well, look at her, you know, she does this and she has this and she has wonderful children and I don't have any, grandchildren, I don't have any. And then the other day I was always like envious, not envious, I felt for a friend of mine, which you don't know, she doesn't live in the area, doesn't live in, fig, in not even in Scottsdale. So all of a sudden she opened up to me and she said she has a four-year-old granddaughter that struggles with autism. And I'm like, you know, I always like, all of a sudden her life is not so perfect. Now, I don't know if that makes sense, but it makes a lot of sense to me when you said a good eye. That's really to be kind. Yeah. So I don't know. Again, it's it's so much easier. Wow. Negativity than it is to go along with. Yeah. But why does it weigh more? Why does it well, weigh more? In the news media, it probably sells more papers or no something. No question. That's know. not even yeah. a question. No, but I, I'm wondering from a Jewish perspective, though, why? Yeah. Okay, I mean, so I'm going to throw the question back at you. I'm going to boomerang it, Stephen. If God, I'm going to, I'll phrase it. I'll set the table for you. If God wants you to develop, not get as a freebie, but develop this thing called Ayin Tuba, this thing that Reb Eliezer tells us is the one character trait that is necessary for the good life. If, if God wants us to develop a good eye, then what is the, what would be the chokhmah? What would be the, the divine reasoning as to why it's not easy to obtain? It's not gl as glaring, it weighs less. What would be God's motivation, so to speak? Well, I think the way you're setting up the question is that it has more value when we work for it than when we're than when it's given to us. That's exactly right. And that, that's like, I mean, sorry, I was a little bit like, you know, I set the whole, all you had to do was eat the cupcake. I set the whole table right. for you, right? right. <laughs> but the, but this is such a fundamental principle. Susie and I learned it when we learned Derech Hashem, the way of God. It's one of the fundamental principles of Jewish theology, which is that God, our self-esteem, our self-worth comes from earning our greatness, that it is not given as a freebie, like the bread of shame, meaning it's not just our greatness, our wisdom, our good eye doesn't come naturally. It doesn't always come naturally in our temperament. 
And the world is designed so that it's actually hard to achieve, so that we truly are partners with self-esteem. We can say, I earned this. I didn't just get it as a freebie. Because if I get it as a freebie, like I, I, I can't attach a sense of self-mastery over the acquisition of the trait. And so God makes himself very hidden to the point where you can deny his existence very comfortably and very easily, but he's there just enough that you can also find him, right? In the land of Israel, it's actually easier to find God because Jewish history is so crazy. It is so crazy. I mean, like, I think I told you the guys this last week, but I have, I mean, I never heard anyone say this, but it seems like this to me that God, that the Soviet Union implodes and some of the Jews leave, but the Jews are all meant to ultimately come to the land of Israel. So then now we have this insane, terrible war where the Ukrainian Jews are all leaving, but guess who's also leaving? The Russian Jews, because they know that the, the, the door is closing on them. So it's like God has a cosmic room and he's saying, nope, I'm gathering you in. So the reason I'm bringing this story up is that God is hidden, but he's revealed just enough that you can find him if you're looking. The world is overtly filled with negativity, but there's so much positivity if you choose to find it and make it front in your brain. So it's just enough that we can acquire our greatness, that we can own our completion so that our, our lives have meaning. If it was super positive and everything was wonderful for the most part, that our ability to have a good eye wouldn't be something that we acquired through our own efforts. This is basic Jewish theology. This is Derech Hashem. This is one of the most fundamental tenets of, of Jewish philosophy. And now you're gonna see, you're laughing, I don't know why. Now you're gonna see Stephen, <laughs> that everything that involves choice, let's put, let's put it like this, desire. When I desire something that's not good for me, let's just do a, uh, sup not superficial, but let's just do a little desire like I'm on my, I, I just waste tons of hours on Netflix, right? So it's very, very easy to do, but it's also possible for you not to do it and for you to overcome it and get the sense of self-worth that comes from, from, from using your time more wisely. In other words, your desires are extremely loud, but, you're all, but you have a wiser part of you that can make life-affirming choices. And when you do, you feel better. Everything in this world, the good is quieter. The, the redemption is quieter, the positivity is quieter so that you have to work to, to acquire it. You'll, you'll notice it everywhere. You'll notice it everywhere that there's choice in every moment. Why? Because we are meant, our whole self-esteem comes from using our free choice to choose life. Ali, that's really funny you should say that because as Steve was asking his question, I was really thinking that that gives us free will and we can- That's what we're talking about, free will. I know, I know. So we can will to be negative, we can be will to be positive. Yes, but but even more than that, Hannah, the will to be negative is like, is like, is like gravitational. And the will to be positive takes effort. It takes more effort for some people than others. But the point is, is that it's all about earning our greatness. We live in this world for 70, 80, 90, 100 years, God willing, right? And we don't have that much time. And we all feel our mortality. We don't have that much time. And we don't know when we're going to die. So we always have to be, like Tahana's, we have to be using our free choice to choose life because that's what our life is about. That's the meaning of our life. And it's to true to happiness, you know, because I was just listening to Dennis Prager, he one of my heroes, and he was talking that he wakes up in the morning and he chooses to be happy. He does. You know, and, and he's really, I just love listening to him because he's very, very happy. 
and very positive. So, and Dennis Prager's main like mantra is happiness is a choice. It's an active choice. It's not a sensation. Exactly. Exactly. It's not like your neurons firing in some like in like some passive way. It is a choice that one must make to relegate. It's I and Tova. Dennis Prager is really talking about the I and Tova. It's a decision to releg relegate what's not good to the to the back of one's brain and to make central what is good in this world. I think that's what Dennis Prager is actually saying. It's a choice. It's an I and Tova. It's really, it's really the same thing as, as I think happiness and an I and Tova are just pretty much the same thing. Anybody else? So we're human. So so we so you can know this and forget it. But do the do this week if you can remember to ask yourself the twenty four thousand dollar question, because it's very important for you to actually start to identify the beliefs that you have about yourself and the world, not just have an amorphous sense of like, I don't know, I'm just down, but to actually start to understand what am I believing to be true about myself and my life and my world and, and write those beliefs down. Susie, are you say, do you want to say something? You're muted. You're muted. You're still muted. You're muted, Susie. Susie, I'm mute. Oh. Hello. <laughs> all right, start again. <laughs> okay. We're all like, you're I, muted. <laughs> um, beautiful class and very motivational. But I also think you said something that you didn't sum up that I think is really important is look for you, and it's motivational for me, look for how you can make the world a better place. And what, what is your task key? What is your, what is your purpose? to ultimately, what does Hashem want you to do? And right. that's a hard thing to figure out, but I think this having a good eye and looking at positivity which pushes you in that direction. Yes, thank you. And also do the, do Tal Ben Shachar's three, sir, do his Venn diagram. If you're trying to figure out how you are uniquely meant to make the world a better place, first draw a circle and inside of the circle say things I'm naturally good at and list them. And then draw another circle and say things that give me a sense of meaning and a sense of pleasure. And then another circle that, and you ask yourself, um, what is, how could, what are, what are things that I could do that would make, would give back to the world? And then try to find out where those three points, those three circles actually meet, where they kiss. And that is a way of understanding how just like Rabbi, Eli, Rabbi um, Yochanan ben Zakkai says, this is the derech tova. This is your derech tova. This is your good path. This is this is your unique tafkid. And Dana, your your anxiety about whatever it is 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 there for a reason because you're not meant to have. It's not a freebie. You've got to work to earn the decision to go for it. But I would say that if you can really assess that those three. I don't know the details, but doing the Venn diagram and filling out those circles and then seeing at what point the three meet is a very, very valuable exercise to do. Ellie, one other thing about Tal Ben Shachal, he does have Zoom classes online. And yeah. anybody, but they're very, very expensive because I looked into it and it's, I don't know, but if somebody can pay for it, um, I would rather support the Lechaim Center. <laughs> I'd rather you do too. <laughs> so, Ellie, excuse um, me, really quick, Ben. The big one, things you're good at, things that bring you meaning and pleasure. Mm -hmm. And then the third yeah. was, and I missed, and that, and right thing, here. and ways you could give back to the world. I think that's right. I, I don't want to misquote him. I know we've done this in the past. I've done this with you, I think, some time ago, but it's been a long time. It's so you know what. I, it, it could be that one circle is what you're naturally good at. One circle is what gives you pleasure. 
Mm-hmm. And the third is, is how you can meaningfully give back to the world. I think I like that, that that's it. That's making more sense because meaning and pleasure aren't the same thing. So I, I'm pretty sure that that's it. Naturally good at, gives you pleasure, meaningfully give back to the world. Okay, thank you. I'm going to look at that. Yeah, yeah. Donna, fill out those circles and figure out where they meet. And then maybe you can compare and contrast what you're thinking about doing with, with your findings. And report back to us next week. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> You've got a lot of accountability partners here. Where's Donna? Next week we'll be like, why isn't she in class? <laughs> Wait a minute. Next week I have a class. It's Memorial Day. I mean, I can. It's up to the group. Nobody's making me hamburgers. <laughs> Well, Yosef probably will. So if I'm not here, you'll know it's not because of that. It's because of Memorial Day. I don't know what right. the kids are doing. <laughs> Can I ask a, a quick question, Ellie? I know you need to go, but I remember in classes in the past, you, you talked twice about two different things, more of the lens of yogurt on the glasses or yeah. looking through the dirty window. Um, is, is, that, is that part of this too? in terms of um, like how you are in your mood, in your point of view at the moment when you're looking through things, yes. how yes. you're viewing things? Yes, 100%. And, and the basic fundamental understanding of this is that we never, we're, we never experience an event. We experience the meaning we give the event. So let's say it's raining, just for a very simple example. Our emotional experience of the rain has nothing to do with the rain. It has to do with the meaning we give the rain. So one person might say rain is regenerative, it's rejuvenative, it keeps the world alive and whatever. And one person might say, I'm gonna kill myself. The weather is so awful all the time, right? And you shouldn't shame yourself for any response. That It's not about shaming, it's just noticing, collecting data on yourself, no taking like noticing that that it's never the event itself never it's the meaning you give to the event it doesn't um a traffic jam doesn't make you upset a traffic jam is a traffic jam it exists in a state of neutrality it just is but it's the meaning you give to the traffic jam that causes you um no don't be sorry we're we're we're, we're done um goodbye donna thinking about you. It's the meaning we're giving to the traffic jam that's causing our experience. That's the lens. The lens is what meaning am I making of this experience? And is it causing me, is it causing me grief? And this is always true. You know, if your child is driving you crazy, it's the meaning you're giving to the experience. It's always going to be true that it's not the experience itself. Thank you, Ellie. I see your article. I just, uh, it's, you wrote it today. It's not the one from last. Well, I didn't write it today, but they published it today. I wrote no, no, it but, yesterday. well, yeah. <laughs> you mean you didn't stay up all night writing it? No. <laughs> but it was not and, easy. Anyway, oh my God, you're an amazing, amazing. No, 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 no. All no, right, no, guys. It was a good class. It was a good class. Thank you. I, it was a great conversation. You, well, uh, David, you're in. read the article him. though, because it's all about I the am. shards. It's, it's not right about here. the shards of creation. Yeah, it's not about the shards of creation, David, but it is about broken shards. And I wanted to put in the shards of creation because it's, but he didn't, he wanted me not to, he, he didn't want it to be too, he tries to keep it not light, but not like heavily, like intensely philosophical or anything. So it's not, so I took out that part, but read the article. It's exact. It's very, it's really the same thing as what you were brought up. So yeah, I'm trying to be it. positive. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Ella. Ella. Thanks everybody. Thanks great Robin. Class. It's great to have you Thanks, back, Robin. Ellie. Goodbye everyone. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.